Hey everybody, it's Matt Michaels here on the DeFalco Files with the owner and creator of FSW, Future Stars of Wrestling here in Las Vegas, Mr. Joe DeFalco. Joe, how you doing today? Doing good, doing good. Staying real busy, you know, we got a lot of stuff that uh, we got planned over the next few months. Yeah, we'll unpack a little bit of the the, uh, the news and everything going down with uh, WWE's announcement of SummerSlam uh, being here in August, and we'll get to that in a little bit. First, let me uh, introduce our guest today. He's been wrestling for, what, about 21 years now with the uh, Just about, with man, the train. 1999, first match. Wow. Uh, Brandon Gatson, he... Uh, he trained with Jesse Hernandez in Southern California. He uh, had a little, uh, I don't know, what would you call it? A, a brief stint with the WWE, a little flirtation, essentially? Yeah, um, yeah, I would say that's a perfect way to put it, a little flirtation. They actually were uh, scouting me towards the end, uh, the last tryout I did. They were scouting me as a ref. Wow. And um, that those conversations went pretty far, and then tri- Triple H put a, kibosh on all the hirings for any um uh, it's salaried employed employees so they were just going into getting um you know the the workers wow which their stance it's all good i don't i don't they they made the right political move they uh they brought drake younger in so (laughs) i actually think that was like my position like one of those yeah (laughs) Oh, man. Well, the stuff you learn every day that you don't know, that's pretty awesome to uh, to hear. And at the same time, very sad to hear. But uh, it also, though, means that you've gotten opportunities to, uh, you know, be on the actual wrestling cards on the uh, circuit here, uh, you know, for a while. And one of the spot- spots that you've wrestled a lot at is FSW. And um, Joe, let's just, uh, let's start with um, the first time that you heard of Brandon Gatson. How did he get onto your radar? Well, I believe when we did our very first show in 2009, uh, you know, I was scouting the scene, the YouTube, who the guys that were, and a couple of guys that we had in mind for the show from the SoCal area where the Young Bucks, uh, Ryan Taylor, and Gatson. Uh, Gatson couldn't make the very first show in the in, in the, the sweat box of the SWAT meet. <laughs> and we brought him in, I believe, at the end of 2009. Uh, Cage. And Brian Cage, it ended up being what we the match of the year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's when uh, Cage was only... 80% muscle. So he was real small back in those days. <laughs> and, you know, without a doubt, it, it was, you know, we had a lot of great matches that year and that quickly, you know, you know, rose to the top, you know, watching, you know, the YouTube clips and, and, and things like that. And Brandon brought a different style. You know, he incorporated that gymnastics along with, you know, submission moves, Things like that, I really, really like. That's why I like Ryan Taylor a lot. I like mm-hmm. to stay a lot. I love Eli Everfly because he's a guy, when you look at him, you know, he's a crazy motherfucker who's going to do this stuff. But, you know, I'm afraid he could tap out Hammerstone if they were doing, if we put it in <laughs> Born Killers. You know, they were beefing at one time. And I remember telling Hammerstone, I'm like, bro, I get you're beefing with Eli, but better watch out because if yeah. he, you out, you are done, bro. And, it's crazy. Well, that's the type of stuff that that's different. You know, there's so much of the same things going on and on and on that having that creativity and being able to be innovative. You know, stuff that Brandon did that you know people didn't do for seven, eight years later, and you see it in the WWE and like, oh my God, this is great. I'm like, yeah, Gatson did that like seven years. <laughs> well, I mean that that really does kind of go towards that idea of you know being one of the first trailblazers um, as we were 
talking a little bit beforehand, um, that idea of kind of the old school slash the new school, you kind of just kind of met everything in between there. Um, was that something, how did you start picking up that stuff, Brandon? Cause I'm, I'm, a, I, I don't see Jesse Hernandez doing flips and flies. No, so, you know, it was like, crazy. Where did you that first Sasuke special I ever did, we were at a baseball stadium show and I just, I got this crazy idea. I think I was talking to my brother, my brother's Olympic gymnast from 2004. So that's kind of where I, I followed his footsteps for a while. And, um, but we were at this show and, and we were out there working out in the ring. And I just, I just, I said, I'm gonna go for it. I got put like four guys on the outside in case it didn't go that well. And I went for it, but, but, um, to go like where I started incorporating it is, is I was trying to quick, quick, quick story. My whole background, like wrestling was my escape in my head at first. So like sure. all my dancing, my acting, singing, all that stuff, like wrestling was my escape to be somebody different. And so I never wanted to incorporate any of that stuff. And that, of course, PWG, they start, they saw the videos and start chanting it. But um, so the gymnastics was the one thing I wanted to incorporate, but having that, that old school mixed with new school type of mentality, because I mean, I was trained by like Suicide Kid and, and Frankie Kazarian, Ricky Reyes, Rocky Romero. Um, having that and taking the athletic part of the gymnastics part, but making it make sense. And we were talking about that earlier. So it's like, you know, um, like when the guys will post their pictures with the dive and you have like eight guys like this, you know, like don't post that picture, you know, <laughs> like post the picture as, as you're doing something. But um, I think that's where, it, that's where it came from. I just like, I wanted everything to make sense. So even like when I do the, um, the cross body, the backflip thing, like it, it's coming off of, of them coming at me and I'm using their momentum, just not like throwing it out of nowhere um cart will splat i mean yeah so it just it's just that blend it's it's that first starting getting that home training of the just the old school mentality and then you know coming up through the years getting all this new new stuff and then trying to take it and i try and tell the younger guys too like just just make it make sense like it's got to make sense no one should no one should stand outside and, and wait for you to come no one stands in front of a train and watches it come at you <laughs> get out the way you know when eli everfly is jumping off the balcony it makes a lot of sense <laughs> well they're not waiting for him right <laughs> there probably not he thankfully he's small enough so if he lands on somebody you know yeah. <laughs> it'll yeah. only like break his leg not kill him right <laughs> uh, well joe with getting a guy like Gadsden into the fold, especially early on, how was it that you were able to make sense when we're talking about, you know, Gadsden talking about making sense in the ring with the story? How is it for you as a promoter to make sense where you have someone coming in from uh, another state to you know, not have it where they're just coming in and coming back and just randomly wrestling guys to maybe create stories for them or opportunities for them to be uh, more part of a regular basis. How does your process work for that? Well, you got to understand when we first started, all we would do is, you know, show every six to eight weeks. So we didn't have the school shows. We didn't have the facility yet. So when we started and Brandon started, we were a brand new company. So people weren't like, oh, Funny Bone is the Vegas guy. We like him. But Brian Cage and Brandon Gatson and the Reno Scum and the Commandos, they're out of state guys. So we're, we're, gonna, we're not going to like them. You know, they were getting to see wrestling for the first time, literally, in probably 10 years. Wow. So. All they did was want to enjoy the shows. And we quickly got on the map because we didn't just localize it. Because back then, compared to now, the local talent was far, far outweighed by the guys that we brought in. You know, tag team 
champions, the first ones were Cyanide and Vintage Dragon. Then it was the Commandos. Then it was the Scum. It was like, it took a long time before any guys out of Vegas became the tag team champs, you know? And doing those shows, it gave us a chance, you know, to build things up. You know, I remember uh, one match I wasn't really happy with. Brandon was wrestling Derek Nykirk. And Nykirk was the top heel. He was going to get the title. And I remember talking to Derek before the show. And I'm like, dude, you know, I, you're going over, but I really need you to make this guy. Like, you know, I, I see really, really good things in it. And Derek really didn't give him shit. It was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And like, it, it was terrible. Like, it, it ended up being a, a glorified squash match. And... You know, fortunately, as time passed, we've made our locker room as good as it can possibly be. People, you know, friendly with each other. Obviously, they want to have the best match, but it's it, it's a different type of atmosphere. And we've been able to incorporate, like, Hammerstone and Graves, great dude, and they bring down Class, who's a great dude. And it's like there's so many good guys that are there that everybody, hey, I saw your match, a guy like Gats, and if he sees something, he's going to be the first guy to tell somebody, you know, and he sees some of this great young talent. Like, you know, we thought Gatson and Cartwheel would be great together, and they did some stuff together, and they worked. And Jack, I even told him, I'm like, hey, you know, watch Gatson. I said, you know, he, he incorporates the gymnastic stuff. He does some stuff very similar to you. And Jack – is doing very well for a guy who's got as little experience as he does, you know, very much. He's yeah. going to be that breakout star in the next year. And Brandon, for you, um, you know, going off of that uh, thought, when you had that experience with uh, Nykirk, what did that do for you? Because at that point, it's not like you were, five months into a wrestling career you you had your experience yeah so i mean what do you do in a situation like that when you're an independent wrestler you're walking into locker rooms where guys will sometimes you know go into business for themselves how do you deal with that kind of stuff i, I honestly i don't like i love this business like too damn much to let something like that like burn it for me like it just do business like 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 joe was saying about the locker room like what what i love one of the big things i love about the locker room is everybody wants to have the best match which means everyone's putting on 100 percent, right everyone also respects each other's match right and respects their place on the card and yeah. um when you have that like one little guy going into business to just like whatever I, I, right. it's hard I'm very non-confrontational it takes a lot it takes a lot to get me going and so not that wasn't that wouldn't have been worth it so sure. it, it was just it, it probably the most that it bothered me was that it upset Joe you know that he was disappointed other than that because I mean you bring me out there to do a job I I mean I, I I'm I'm to the point where I love this business so much that if I'm not happy with what I did, I won't take the pay. Wow. It's like you hired me to do something. I don't feel like I went out and did it. Don't pay me. You know, wow. I've done that plenty of times. And even the promoter was happy, but I wasn't. So it's just that to let someone that went into business for themselves, like make me sour about the business. It's not going to happen. That's, that's remarkable to hear. Um, Joe, when you hear something like that, um, you know, obviously you know Gatson's personality very well. Does that kind of encourage you that there are still guys out there who, even if you were happy with them, they, if they did not feel they did a, a great job or the job they were supposed to do, you know, that they'll do something like that where they'll be like, don't pay me or, you know, hey, book me next month, but I, I won't take any booking fee or anything like that is that something that you 
you rarely see um and is that something that younger wrestlers uh should kind of take a, a cue from and listen to because in the end you're an independent contractor if you didn't do the job if i got a guy to do drywall and the job was shit i'm not gonna pay him is that kind of the same mentality with independent wrestlers not really to me you know the bottom line is a guy had to drive five hours to get here four hours to drive back whatever you know things don't always work out you know i've had a couple of guys that were like that and it's like you know i have to force the money on them because you know as brandon can tell you he doesn't work for me because i'm the highest paying guy he worked for fsw because everything i just explained good matches there's going to be a really good crowd they're hot as fire and you know brandon has been probably one of the longest tenured guys but he's been so in and out that you know i remember we were doing some good stuff with jacob austin young and and he hurt and he got hurt on a few different occasions and then i hadn't really heard from him for a while and then he hit me up he was going to be in town and my thought was, hey, you know what? He's like, hey, is it cool if I come by the show? And I'm like, why don't you work this show? And he didn't even have his gear. I remember he was wearing jeans. I went to Ross. I went to Ross and got some camo pants. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I went up to Chris Bay and I said, bro, I got a match for you tonight. It's going to be good, man. This guy's really good. And, you know, Chris Bay being the youngster that he is. He's got no fucking clue who Brandon Gatson is, you know? <laughs> and they went out there. And I remember like 30 seconds into the match, Brandon took this huge bump on the outside that all of a sudden people were like, what the fuck? And it ended up being a really, really good match. And then we kind of got him back in the mix. And, you know, obviously with the pandemic and things, but he's gotten himself in some phenomenal shape. And... You know, the, the one difficult thing about the FSW crowd is one thing about with Brandon, he, he's, he, he'll tell you he's not the best promo in the world, okay? He's going to go out there, but he is going to put on a great match. Now, when you're newer, and it's like watching with Eli Everfly now, now that he's being more consistent, like I think Brandon, and, and I got to credit class also for being the heel that he is, that Brandon got a, a very, very good reaction from the crowd in the match. And I believe that has to do a lot with him being there. Now they're seeing him on a consistent basis. Yeah. They're seeing the cool shit that he, he, he's capable of doing. And, you know, with the guys like Gatson and Quest and Eli – that and cartwheel that we've kind of added to the no limits division and with Jay Vidal breaking out and stuff like that. Like this division is crazy. You know, like I'm really looking forward to that limitless tournament of the question is, is it 12 guys or 16? Cause there's so many of them, <laughs> that, you know, if you love that style of wrestling, you know, that's going to be one of the best 12 or 16 man tournaments that you're going to see. And the fact that Brandon has been doing it for so long that, you know, not that he's 50 or nothing like that, but, you know, compared to these 22 year olds, you know, he could go just as well as those guys, you know, he hasn't lost right. that. And it's just exciting, you know, putting together shows and like, you know, he always loves it. Oh, another scramble match, but it's like, Hey, those are great matches, but I'd rather get the four of those guys on than leave two of them off. Yeah. Right. Uh, what is that like for you, Gatson, where, you know, the, the idea of the crowds like that, um, especially when you're, you're not local and you're coming in at, at the pace you were coming in at, and it's kind of like speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down. Now you're kind of more, back into the constant you know coming back in um do you find that playing you know the, the baby face role now in vegas essentially because of guys like class who are so good at being heels is that something that's appealing to you 
to, I know you're very selfless when it comes to the approval of the crowd in terms of cheers versus booze, because obviously, you know, you know, the difference between the job you're doing and just fans loving you in general. Is that something you look at? Is fan reaction in terms of, you know, growing into a, a market like Las Vegas? Um, I, I mean, I, I say that one more time. <laughs> well, as, as opposed, like, obviously, you know, fans will cheer or boo because of character. Right. But at a certain point, because of what Joe's saying, where they get to know you um, and, and you've been in and out for such a long period of time does that play on you now that you're finding that the fans are actually now investing in you as someone who actually is local to them even though you're not yeah. located in vegas yeah no that def that definitely plays a part it's um it it really really it really helps with with the match and for me it about 10 years ago i finally I figured out how to listen to them and like only them listen to them, not worry about the match and feed, feed off of them and listen to them. And it, it took me a long time to, to figure that out. Once I did it, things just opened up for me, like ideas, just everything came. And so now that they're slowly investing back in me, it's um it's really easy to feed off of and go out there and, deliver what they need to see because depending on where you are on the card you know they don't always need to see hold the hold they don't always you know it doesn't it doesn't always call for all that so when they're not invested in you or when they're not fully there for you like in a match where for e either guy both guys you kind of have to test the waters and you have to go through all those steps and you have to tell that story and, and feel them out but once they're once they're with you it gives you a just a huge um just a, a list of extra things you can do now that you could, couldn't have because you were wasting, not wasting time, but you were spending the time to get them invested in you. Once they're already invested in you, you have so much more things you can do. Right. With them, playing with their emotions and all that, especially if they're invested in you. Um, in the uh, early days of you coming out here, what was, you know, one or two of your favorite matches or one or two, uh, one or two of your matches that you, you know, didn't necessarily feel that hit the mark that you would have wanted it to. Um, well, definitely that cage match. That was great. Um, I really liked my match with Vic Capri. You remember that one, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. The ice pick. Yeah. I really that liked was that. A match. Great, that was a great match. That was fun. Um, Matches that didn't hit the mark. I, uh, engaging you the rematch was yeah it? the rematch when I was out a huge out of uh, way out of shape, gassed <laughs> gassed like two minutes in, um, oh. the rematch oh. with Cage yes, and then uh, the Boston Young and you had some good stuff yes, I was to say him and then I had a I had a good match with um Bryce, Bryce. yeah. Bryce and um, I, I can't remember too many. I don't. I think maybe the Rick Ellis was that match good. I can't remember. See, uh, I think that was when Rick came back after the knee injury, and he was nowhere near yeah. what he was because he was awesome. Yeah, he got hurt. So I got a match with him a couple couple weeks. He's, um, I think he had Heather Lynn. That's when I gave her a stunner. Yes, yes, I do remember <laughs> that. It's funny if you, go, if you go on YouTube and you type in Stunaho, I got two videos on there, part one and part two. It's great. It's it's Stun-ho. poor poor naming, but it is, it's it's funny. Uh, Joe, when you think of uh, that, um, uh, when you're talking about uh, Jacob Austin, uh, Young, and uh, you know Bryce, guys like that was was that your goal in terms of being able to use Gatson in kind of that babyface role against some of these guys in the heel factions well initially 
we made the one mistake of having Brandon after he won the cast in the case. We were in Mesquite, and we figured this is going to be a great time. Matt Hardy was going to help Gatson win the No Limits Championship, and a lot of those people in Mesquite had no idea what's going on. They said, I walk in with a briefcase. Matt Hardy gives a stunner. We got a new champion, and it was like, hey, and the crowd goes mild because, like, they had no clue what was going on. And the pop that he would have gotten in the pop that it would have gotten in Vegas, man, really that pop would have been crazy Mesquite. at Silverton or Samstown. That pop would have been insane, man. You know, and then uh, a couple of the big moments when we did stuff with uh, we when we turned Brandon heel, uh, him and Jacob Austin Young they had a great match. They shook hands, blah blah blah. And while Jake was on the ramp at Samstown. Brandon came out with the case and clocked him over the head. And that was like the first time, like the fans were like really, really engaged in where this feud was going. And then unfortunately, Brandon had some back problems and we never really got to, uh, you know, it was kind of jinxed. It was the same thing with Bryce Harrison with Jacob Austin Young. Bryce got hurt. Like we never got the full I think you didn't get the full payoff. Yeah, you, you know, in that situation. But, uh, you know, when the following came back, the main event at the Silverton was Brandon versus Gregory Sharp in at the Silverton. And that's when... Uh, Bryce, Bryce came back, right? Yeah. And, and that was a huge moment. And that was a really good match, man. And it was like, we were a little nervous because it was like, ah, you know... No limits title, Gatson and Sharp in the main event, but because of the angle, it was it was one of the it ended up being one of the better main events that that we had. Um, what's that feeling like for you, Gatson? Where you know you get these opportunities to work the casinos, um, which are usually a bigger and hotter crowd because of the environment, and then to get to main event it and to have a storyline play out like that. What is that for you in terms of when everything comes together as a performer in the ring? Man, that's, 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 uh, that's one thing I love about Joe is uh, there's, I don't know how many promoters are out there that care so much about their product. Like I, I, I will work so hard for any promoter that puts time and effort, production value, all that into their product. And um, because I mean, I'm I'm on that end, my regular job. I've been in the industry entertainment side forever. And so when I see someone that believes in their stuff and cares, and puts money behind it, like I'm doing everything I can. So when when put in a position and you can hit it out the ballpark and then you see everything that the promoter planned, the storyline, all that, everything come to fruition. It's like it's it's a great feeling. It's it's. It's awesome because like how many things had to come together for it to work and they all did it, it you know it, it's what 50 50 a lot of the times when when you do these on shows so when they when they actually get hit out of the park man it's awesome i remember that when bryce revealed himself man that was cool let me let me ask you on the flip side of that um what what has been the most difficult thing for you in dealing with having a history of injuries, has that been a kind of a deterrent for you? Uh, anything that gets you down because, you know, you might be really getting hot and then you have an injury and then you work back and you're, yeah. you know, it's like, a, it's a, such a vicious cycle. How, how are you dealing with that, you know, mentally and physically uh, so that you can stay in the game? Um. Well, I'll tell you what, the, this shoulder thing with, with Matt, this was like probably my biggest injury. And that was, I made it how long before, like a major, major injury? Um, yeah, about 20 years, 20 years without a major injury. Um, and then, so since, since then I blew out my calf, I've uh, tore my hamstring and then I uh, tore my groin all in the span of like a year oh. and a half during this stupid pandemic. And only two of them were actually done wrestling. <laughs> wow. wow. Um, but I've adapted 
a different training style, as you, I guess you could say. I've been doing a lot more cage grappling um, training. I help teach some grappling and wrestling at an MMA uh, jujitsu place, and um, I've been I've been doing a lot more body stuff rather than weights. So it's yeah. like I, I post some videos up there where I'm doing uh, burpee into picking up the heavy bag flipping it the burpee for just everything where it incorporates everything and i I've, i'm finding it to uh feel a lot like i'm not hurting that bad uh the next day after a match like i used to um and actually as you get older it doesn't even set in until two or three days later like right you'll wrestle friday night saturday you'll be fine sunday you're, you can't get out of bed <laughs> like what the heck happened yeah. it's like delayed i just actually call something it's like delayed onset something but um but as far as staying in the game, uh, so I was telling Joe, these frays are getting a little, uh, <laughs> I'm getting a little up there in age, man, but uh, I'm, st I'm still able you have, to... less, you have less to do. <laughs> right? you, can, you can go on the outside for a couple of minutes and, you know, and, and take a break and watch those, those young guns like Cartwheel and Jay Vidal and Vandergrip. They do their crazy stuff. And when they're down and out, now you slide right back in. I struggle with that. I struggle with that because I just, I, I like being involved, man. But no, yeah, I feel you. I just, um, when I'm, when I'm involved in a match, it's, I like to just like, I think for like 30 minutes before my match starts, I don't really even talk to anybody. I'm just like, not psyching myself out, but I just, I love being involved. So like that's, those phrases are hard when I'm like outside, I'm like, all right, I got to do something. Even with, even with that ladder match we did, I, I was like, even getting on the apron and then, then knocking me back off and stuff. It was just like, I got to stay involved somehow. Can't just sit here. Right. Um, and that's, that's uh, amazing in terms of dedication to it because you love it. Um, Joe, when you see Gatson's, um, perseverance and his love of wrestling does that make it easier for you to entrust him and and of course working with him for so long now but to entrust him in uh doing what you see happening you know how you want something done if you know that you put Gatson in this match then you're going to get what you need out of that match is that kind of how you look at it when you use them well compared to the other crazy guys high flyers risk takers you know brandon looks at it in a different way especially with the younger guys you know they want to do their cool shit and brandon kind of molds it to like hey you know maybe this would work a little bit better but at least he's the voice and he's like the voice of reason when it comes to those guys, because he has no problem doing crazy stuff too, but it's like trying to put it into the, into the, the, the framing of it making tons of sense. So it's yeah. like, you know, when we do those five way matches, he'll be the only one to come up to me and say, Hey, what do you think about this? Hey, is somebody doing this somewhere else? You know, the other guys are just like excited. It's cool. They're they, they know it's like I put those guys in charge of having the cool, you know, one of the coolest matches on the show. You know, a lot right. of go out there, kill it, have fun, blah, blah, blah. What and you know, knowing that Brandon's in there, he's gonna, you know, keep things a little bit in check at least, and making sure that, you know four spots that you're going to see in the match didn't just happen the last two matches to where it becomes, you know, but great. We just saw that, you know, the, the old snap mare kick to the head or, Hey, yeah. do 14 suicide dives on the show today. That's the under over, you know? Yeah. You know another thing, another thing I do is, um, and, and most most promoters trust me now. Is like I'll, I'll I'll go up there and I'll I'll ask them what do you need tonight, what do you need out of it, what do you need for the finish, and they'll yeah. usually trust me with the match. And then I I'm always respectful enough to be like, can we go on the outside? Or well, I already know what Joey wants us to go on the outside, so we're good on that. But um, 
just other shows, other other promoters, I, I always check because it depends on where I'm at on the card. And is anyone else doing a dive? You know, you have me semi main event. Is anyone diving? Is the main event of diving? If they're diving, I'll just tease my dive. I won't do it so that they can still have the pop for theirs. You know, so sure. it, it's yeah, that the trust part that you were talking about with Joe is like it's really it's re really nice to have established myself to a point where I I can go up them go up to them and say what's the, you know what's the story? What do you, what do you need? out of this guy what do you need out of this match for my opponent does he need to be strong does he need to steal something like what what needs to happen and then and then they trust me with it which it's very very nice to get to that point um joe when you when you look at um getting gatson back into the fold what was your thought process on being able to have him back because it had been a while since uh, Brandon had wrestled for you. Did you, did you know, you know, that you were getting the same Gatson or did you think that, Hey, here is a guy who has a little more experience, a little more maturity now, a little more of a built physique. Um, what were you looking at when you were bringing him back into the fold? Well, there was really no thought of it until he ended up doing the match with Chris Bay. And it was like, hey, you know, because I'm pretty sure he had taken some time off because, you know, I hadn't seen posts. I haven't really didn't really see a lot of things when it came to him. But the thing, I was always a big fan of Brandon Gatson, the person. So when things were able to work out, you know, he was always a guy – I wanted to. Sometimes we did, you know, way smaller shows at, at the facility. So cost-wise, it wasn't beneficial for for both for either party. You know, we had right. to cost down. He was a guy who's been doing it a long time, and, and he's given us a break as it is. It's hard. You can't keep asking a guy to give us even more of a break on their break. So right. it's now that we've opened up and done stuff. You know, he's a great asset to have. And I really like him personally. And, and that's how it kind of is when you see guys that are around regularly. You know, there's some people, eh, they might have had some issues. And we've had guys like that. And more or less, those are the local guys that they're kind of around. But I have no reason to use a good wrestler who's an asshole from California. You know, right. a lot of good wrestlers. You, you know what I mean? And it's like yep. if I did four way and it was cartwheel quest Gatson and Everfly, and then Gatson couldn't make it, and I plugged in Funny Bone, it's good stuff. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter. There's nine guys that could fit those four spots. So if there's a tenth guy who's a fucking douchebag, but he could right. wrestle, well, odds are if he's really good, he's no better than those other guys. So, so why would I want to hassle in the locker room? Oh, I don't really want to be pinned. Oh, well, what about this for me? You know, and, uh, and I even get that from younger guys, you know. I, I, it was hilarious. We did the show this week, and there's a kid who's been training with us for about two weeks, okay? And he's very helpful, and he's in the back. And the match was over, and I see a message from him. And he basically, like, trying to get a spot first off it's at 8 10 halfway through our show and he's pitching a fucking spot for himself and you know i have no problem answering back firmly and honestly and i'm like bro you've been doing this for two fucking weeks the last thing you need to do is hit me up about anything because nobody cares what you want to do it's like unbelievable Wow. And, and then there's guys further along than that that have been around. And, you know, the ones actually ask me the question. The dumber ones or, or the, the scareder ones, you know, they'll go to Cody, they'll go to Remy, they'll go to, they'll go to you know, Damian Drake, Vandergriff, guys that I kind of have in my circle to, like, you know, try, try to get something. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know... Every, everybody has an opinion and it's great. 
you know, like I always joked about the Suavecitos, you know, oh, they're going to have the banger of the night and they're going to do this. And, oh, <laughs> you know what? For the time frame they're in, they're awesome. But I once told them, you know, for guys doing it for eight months, you guys are great. If you told me you guys were doing it for four years, I'd say you fucking sucked. So, you know, the, you know, you got to take all that stuff into consideration. It's great that everybody wants to be on every show, you know, and the Suavecitos and Quest really worked well together. And it really helped both parties because Quest's another guy kind of in and out, great worker. Yeah. But he had anything other than going out and having a match. And now there's a little bit of a background. There's a little bit of a story. And now people can invest. And that's what our fans especially want to be able to do. They want to invest in that person. They they know Hammerstone and Graves, they're local guys to our fans because they've been there, been here for nine years. Yeah. It was funny when you say that. I, I never understood the whole don't want to be pinned thing because like there's I just I have this whole this philosophy on I I'd be backstage and I'd see people being mad about in a match with a certain person who maybe doesn't like to sell or uh, doesn't want to bump or whatever. And like the great thing about professional wrestling is you can never master it, right? It's, yeah. it's an art form that's always evolving. You always have to change. So you can never master, master it. So it's always, you're always working, you're always learning. So like when you're in a match like that and you got to be pinned or whatever, like the goal or the mindset should be, how do I make myself relevant? How do I make myself matter? So after I pin, they cheer for me or they're, they're, they're invested in me still, even though I lost the match. Cause I mean, right. the, who keeps track of that? It, they, they're worried about the investment, not who won or lost. You know, I, I remember one time, I don't, I couldn't even tell you who it was, but they were kind of like whiny about it. And it was like, Hey, I got a different idea. How about we have a shoot fight between you two and whoever wins wins because the other guy would beat the fuck out of him and it's like, dude it's like you know but but those are the situations and if guys like that like from out of state that are getting a booking i remember and you know you know rivera okay he's a guy who years ago i think they were he was teaming with limelight at the time okay and gino was hit me up hit me up hey you know, I, I think, is Gino the one that was uh, doing the reserves or is that Limelight? That's Limelight. Limelight, yeah. All right. So Limelight had hit me up because he was going to be in Vegas here and there. And this was probably five years ago when these guys, especially Gino, probably only had a year or two in. So they were doing uh, their tag team gimmick at Hollywood. And it was like, okay, you know what? You know, I got a spot. The players club was Hater and Cash at the time. And I think they were the tag champs or, or, or they were, they were really over at that point. So I had booked those guys to wrestle. And then I got this long letter from Gino basically questioning when he was going to get his win back. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And it's like, well, yeah, you know, I'm like, bro, this is the first time you're working for me. How about you do the job that I asked you to do? And then if you do it well, then I'd invite you back. But there's no getting wins back. Oh, and whatever ended up happening, we, we didn't use it, okay? And it was just like, not using this motherfucker. And we've talked a lot since, and we actually almost had him booked uh, against uh, Remy. But he's grown up, and, you know, he's changed. As now he's the guy you see on Facebook blasting the young guys who, you know, Yep. Want to do everything that he wanted to do when he was, you know, in the business for a year or two. And, and that's what you need to see guys who grow up and as they learn the business and there's veterans around who explain things to them and they take it instead of being, Oh yeah, I've been doing this for three years. I fucking know everything. I don't need to help set up a ring. Oh, we'll let the other guys do it. And it's like, if guys like Damian Drake and Matt Vandergriff and Lacey Ryan were able to set up the ring, 
you low card motherfuckers, I don't care how long you've been doing it, you can help set up the ring. Especially when we're doing shit at the school. It's like you don't have to break down the ring. You don't have to do nothing. You got to bring some chairs in, uh, yeah. put them in the back. And it's like the laziness of just trying to like get over. Like they're getting over on me by, you know, trying to do as little as possible. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting point. Um, Gatson, when you look at that from the perspective of a veteran, um, is that something that you've seen kind of develop more over the years to where the younger kids are coming in with a totally different attitude than guys like you when you started um, in terms of there's just more of a feeling of entitlement now? There's a, there's a huge, huge feeling of entitlement. And, you know, and, and just to touch on some of that is that when I started wrestling school was still, it wasn't like out there like it is now, you know, like I found out I, I was doing a, a skit at, at school at a lip sync show in between. I did a stone cold and the rock skit and my tag team partner that I started with in the business, he was already training with Jesse and he was in the crowd and he came and asked me and you know, that's kind of how you learned about wrestling school and all that. It wasn't like advertised and all that. And so like when you showed up to wrestling school, like, you didn't step in the ring. You pay. You paid your due first. You know. You 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 got dressed. You were you, you were dressed and boots on in an amount of time where you didn't get in the ring. And yep. you didn't you didn't even jump in the ring until you were instructed to get in the ring. You didn't just get, so it's different now because it's it's um I feel like it's more ran as far as wrestling is concerned. It was more ran like a business, and so you know you can't. You can't break a guy's leg and see if he's going to come back to see how much he wants it. You know, you, right. you're looking out on that money. And, um, but I think within that, some of this entitlement has come too because it's, it's not, we're not as hardcore on these kids and training them. I, I, I might be different up there in Vegas, but what if I experienced? Oh, no, 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 no. That's definitely the okay. same. What, what I've, what I've experienced out here is, is just, it's, it's mind blowing to me. Cause I, me and my part tag partner would scrounge up change. He had a old Honda, a little 88 Honda that got like 50 miles a gallon. And we all, we, we would, we wouldn't eat lunch at school. We'd use that money for gas money to go to wrestling school at night and then be back to school the next morning. It would, training was eight to midnight. So, um, but you don't, you don't, it's just, I think I think what it is is the same thing in, in my um, where I work when I do uh, you know I mix movie trailers and stuff for Sony Pictures and um, you know I went to school and I learned how it used to be done right without all the technology where you were splicing this film piecing it together I, I got to learn all that and it made me have an appreciation for what I'm able to do now with technology right, right? and I think that appreciation has been lost with wrestling school and with these students when they go on to becoming performers or special wrestlers um that that appreciation and it's not instilled that discipline is not instilled like it used to be when it's like you were invited to come train wrestling you didn't go and just pay money and now you're you're admitted in no you had to be you know accepted right accepted by everybody or you got your ass kicked I remember my second, I think my second training session, I got a top rope body splash from Bo Cooper. I'll never forget it. Oh my God. But I mean, it's initiation stuff, man. Like you know, that yeah. stuff doesn't happen anymore. No, oh, yeah. Well, you can't because, you know. Oh yeah. You can't say a lot of things anymore without, that's why I tell, I try to, that's one thing you also try to teach. Like don't make personal opinions on uh, Facebook. Because, yeah. as I said, no matter what you say, you're going to be pissing off 50 Somebody. of whoever you, what you're saying. Because yep. it's always a 50-50 breakdown. Like, I don't care. Trump, Biden. If you say something good about one, then the other one is, oh, you're an asshole. How can you do that? But it's like, just stay out of there. Promote your shows. Promote what you're doing. Former. You know, 
even that WWE, AEW, they don't want to see you making political statements. Mm -mm. Right. No, I try. I, I definitely, yeah, I feel you on that. I try and keep everything just as positive and just my journey, family, just anything. Like if, if I offend you with my family pictures or something, <laughs> screw you, but, you know, like you got to stay, you got to just stay neutral, stay, or just shut up, just stay positive, motivate. Yep. You know, uh, hey, you know what? I'm thinking I was just, you know, we were talking like the scramble matches, but Brandon had a good idea. We haven't done the fray in a long time. The fray was that little, you know, two guys start, and then after a couple minutes, another guy comes in. You might have something for the anniversary show right there. There we go. Yeah, that, that would be phenomenal. Um, because it is isn't something that's done in you know regularly um, and and it's not a one pin win situation either right exactly exactly um and you know speaking of that joe let's talk a little bit about um oh wait but now four guys are gonna complain they got pinned instead of just <laughs> gats is gonna be like but i came up with the idea why am i getting <laughs> But then, but then again, at, at his age, maybe it's like, you know, hey, I'll take the first pin. I'm good. I'll just, <laughs> I'll watch the rest no, of it back. No, I'm not there. I'm not there yet, man. Keep me to the end. <laughs> I don't mind getting pinned, but. <laughs> um, speaking so, of Joe, pin. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of um, shows, let's talk just a little bit. Give a, a little bit of your perspective of uh, how this past Saturday's uh Calm before the storm show uh how you thought it went and some of the highlights uh for fans who might not have seen it yet uh you know to check so they can you know get excited and check it out on the fsw uh network yeah uh it definitely was the calm before the storm because before the show we had some internet issues that they were going in and out so we couldn't even air it live on the network um uh, but then the show opened up in a pretty, uh, not an upbeat manner as the unguided who've been killing it. Uh, Damian Drake has to get surgery next week and they had to vacate the championships. And, you know, that was disappointing. They were going to wrestle the winner of Death Proof R&B, uh, their best of three series. And it was going to be a two out of three fall match. So that is now going to be for the tag team championships and that's going to be on night one uh but matt vandergriff he obviously is extremely talented had some great matches and not only is he going to enter the rumble uh at number two because he wants to start you know he's a guy who who pushes himself uh, as much or more than anybody i know not only is he going to go in the rumble at number two, he's already called out and it's been accepted that he'll go one-on-one -on -one with TJP, TJ Perkins on night two. Now, if Vandergriff wins the rumble, then he gets to do double duty and he does, you know, he loses the tag belts and he wants to get all the belts now. So, <laughs> you know, there's a lot to look forward to on that. Uh, to me, the match of the night, once again, was Eli Everfly. And this time, it was against a guy who, you know, younger guy, under the radar, in a tag, you know, solid mid-card tag team. But, you know, Adriel Noctis, you know, did more in that match to, to elevate himself than he has in, in the last two years. And him and Eli just killed it. And it was uh, a tremendous match, you know, between those two. And, and Eli just continues his, uh, his string of great matches. The latter match, uh, when he worked Hyperstreak, when he worked, uh, you know, Jay Vidal. And, he, you know, he has just been tremendous of late. So, you know, you know very excited, you know, to see, you know, a lot of the matches, you know, they were all very good. They were, you know, there was nothing that's, you know, and eh, there's always a clunker or two, but everything went uh, relatively well. 
uh, the four-way, uh, kind of the feast or famine match with Nino Black, Hero, Lou, Toa, and Graves. You know, if you like the bruiser weights, as I like to call them, uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to see Toa and Graves really soon in a uh, one-on-one match, you know, down the line. And that's the yeah. thing. As many stars as we had, say, before the pandemic, the Remy's, the Ice Williams, guys like that, it's like Toko Uso has really exploded. You know, Gatson has come back strong. Eli Everfly, Adrian Quest, class. You know, Jordan Cruz had a really good match against Brandon uh, against Remy Marcel. And, you know, Jordan Cruz is extremely underutilized. You know, he's a great talent. The thing is, there's just unfortunately or fortunately so many guys that sometimes when you're mixing and matching and trying to put stuff together, you know, not everybody is able to get on those shows. And right now, you know, Jordan's a guy who's been way more sporadic than we had hoped for. Yeah. Um, And with the uh, anniversary shows coming up, uh, when you're putting together two nights like this um, and you have something happen like an injury to a tag champ, nonetheless, um, is it, is it totally that kind of uh, feeling of, okay, here's the obstacle. How do we overcome that and still take something and raise the bar even so we take the negative and turn it into a positive? Well, we have done that since day one. You know, when we were running shows at the Silver Nugget, you know, I remember the old days working at the strip club, and I remember getting a message one time, Gatson couldn't make it. And we've had those situations where we're scrambling. Uh, Nykirk was supposed to beat Kenny King for the, the championship. And then like a day or two before, the whole Arizona crew pulled out. You know, and that, that's when Modest became the champion. You know, we have to adapt and do things. It is funny, though, that a lot of times it's like things get changed at the last minute and it ends up working out way better than I believed it would have worked out the first time. You yeah. know, whether it was because of an injury, somebody couldn't make it. Hey, we had to change this match because there was an issue with this person. And... You know, it's the same thing in the anniversary show, you know. uh, Things have happened. We're going to make an announcement about somebody not being there. But in turn, uh, we got EC3, who is now scheduled to be there both nights and worked out a good deal. You know, he was there many years ago, teaming with Robbie E against the Whirlwind Gentleman at Sandown. And, you know, EC3... You know, he's got himself, this guy was always in great shape, but now this guy is in phenomenal shape. And, you know, he, he has basically gone out there and he's trying to do things his way and it seems to be working. And, you know, we're excited to have him at the show. And now, you know, I guess I can announce it now. We're going to post it a little later. Uh, One of the hottest, you know, indie guys, Casey Navarro, who's been working AEW he has been signed uh, to appear. You know, maybe he'll be in the fray. Who knows? You know, trying to get as many guys. And it's the most difficult part is we got a 30-man rumble. And putting that together is definitely, without a doubt, the hardest match that I will put together this year or any year when we do the rumble. It's trying to mix and match, set things up sometimes for the future, set things up that have been involved in the past, trying to move things along and what we're looking to do. But, you know, the card's set. You know, we got Maserati defending against Sandra Moon. She's proven herself to be the number one contender. Uh, at Death Proof and R&B, that's now a title match. Remy Marcel against Sean Devari. Uh, we got the Rumble match. We have the Prey match that as of right now has Brandon Gatson, a youngster from NorCal Midas Creed uh, in it, as well as Adrian Quest. And uh, somehow, 
I'm blanking on who the other guy is. Eli? Was that? Eli? No, uh, we're waiting on Eli. He's trying to make himself available. Oh, Funny Bone. How could I Funny Bone, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, that that's some frame match right there, if that's how we, we end up going. And then uh, Chris Bay. So, and Gregory Sharp and Jay Vidal. You know, that's night one. You know, night two, the winner of the Rumble wrestles Hammerstone. We got TJ versus Vandegrift. We got Ice Williams versus Limelight. So, you know, and then probably the winner of the tag team titles will have them defend on the uh, the next night. So, you know, and Chris will be in action because he won't be he won't be able to be at the Rumble. So, which is a major loss. Uh, you know, he's he's without a doubt one of our top talents. Love to see yeah. him in that match. So. You know, there is so much going on. You know, we got the after party. There's a buffet included for the fans for only 25 bucks, and it's all you can eat. And we got the meet and greets, and, and you know, we got so much going on this weekend. You know, it's great to see finally we can, you know, do it the way we want to do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Brandon, as we uh, kind of wrap up here, when you think about – um, your experiences with FSW is is there something that sticks out to you as being a moment where you just absolutely you know kind of look at it and go man I love this business I love what I get to do is there something that sticks out to you that just makes you think yeah man I'm so glad I got this opportunity in Las Vegas off the top of my head, it would have to be that heel turn on Jacob. That was uh, that was probably one of two heel turns ever attempted by me <laughs> and any promoter wanting me to go that direction. And uh, yeah, I mean that I just remember standing up there with that case in Samstown, knocking him out and just standing there. It was a it's weird. It's weird that the that it's that moment, but that it just felt felt good because it was pretty much the only successful heel turn <laughs> I did. I'm just I'm just so saturated out here with like EWF and stuff that it's that it's to that point where they just know you and they just like you. You can't really right. it's not it's, which is still challenging me. I still want to try and get them to hate me, but it's really, really tough. <laughs> and and Joe, speaking of that as we wrap up here, um what is that like for you as a promoter when you have someone who is, you know, Gatson's mold like that, where you just, you want to see him turn heel. You want to try it. But the honest truth is he's a good guy and people like him. How do you look at it where you try a heel turn and then you go, okay, maybe we should uh, go back, you know, to the route of you being a baby face. It's the positioning of how you do things. You know, Jacob Austin Young at the time was becoming the hottest guy in the No Limits division. You know, they were showing a respect thing with him and Gatson. So when he turned, you, you always have to have the guy turning against a guy who's more popular than him. You know, it's hard. You know, if Chris Bay turned on, for example, uh, Mondo rocks. I just don't see it because Mondo's popular, but Chris Bay's the most popular guy. Now, right. we were able to do it successfully with Graves turning on Sefa because we saw when they wrestled each other that Graves, who was one of the most popular guys ever in FSW, all of a sudden they had the match and then Sefa started to be probably getting a few more cheers. So they right. did the respect thing after the match. Things went by the way they did. And then in a big moment with Hammerstone, he came out, the crowd was chanting for Graves because we, you know, we foreshadowed it earlier. We did a tag, we did this. And they chanted for Graves when it was Gallo and, and Hammerstone beating down Sefa, no DQ. Graves came in. And then he chokes out Sefa and Hammerstone wins. 
And the crowd was just like, what the fuck just happened? Because Sefa was the guy. Graves was a guy. And when he did it, you know, uh, I'm not sure the transition from Hyperstreak to Gregory Sharp would have worked, except he killed Jay Vidal with the kendo stick. Well, Jay yeah. Vidal is like the hottest guy we got right now. So a guy like Hyperstreak, who was really liked, he disappeared, you know, 11 years, finally getting that opportunity, you know, to become the Nevada State champion. The guy's, you know, this it's a shoot. The dude's never won a title anywhere, you know. Yeah. He does have bitterness, you know. Me and him had some issues, you know, more recently than in the past about feeling undervalued and things like that. And then when he lost, like, I'm pretty sure that kendo stick shot was 11 years of frustration. It came out and it was believable of how he felt about how everybody, the fans, oh, here's Chris Bay. We love this guy. Here's Cross. We love this guy. Oh, Jay Vidal. And it's like, well, what about him? You know, I always say, what about me? What about Raven? Well, it's the same situation with these guys that they busted their ass for a long time. And, you know, a guy like Hyperstreak, as they like to say, he's a great hand, you know, and he's always going to have a good match and he's always going to be there, but he's always right there. And there was always that new flavor of the month that would step in and, and kind of overshadow him. And that's how he felt it. And that's how it was taken. So as you, and then when you go the opposite way, as Brandon was was talking about, you're there forever, okay? Well, Hammerstone and Graves kind of left before the pandemic as heels. When they came back, they were happy to have wrestling back. So Hammerstone and Graves were guys that they had seen for years, and they were happy that Hammerstone and Graves were returning, and without doing anything, they were now baby faces. So we yeah. have now put Hammerstone in with the heels, and as great a promo with Hammerstone is, he was able to turn it around. And, you know, despite everything, I miss the fans. It's great to be back. How the hell do you not cheer that dude? And put him in that position. And he's a baby face. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's wonderful how that all comes out and works in the end. And it creates great drama and great shows. Um, and we are now 10 days away from uh, night one of the anniversary show. So everyone, if you haven't gotten tickets yet, go to FSW and uh, go to the website, purchase your tickets now. Also, if you can't get out to the FSW uh, show, the anniversary show will be on pay-per-view on Fight TV. Um, so look that up. Um, two and, nights special, uh, two nights special, save five bucks. Are there, there any tickets go. left, Joe? There are tickets left. Front row is sold out. Second night, front row, there's probably like five left. We're trying to maneuver that maybe the day of the show, you know, we can squeeze another two or three, but it's, it's, we've squeezed as far as we could squeeze on the, uh, on the front rows. Gotcha. There you go. And uh, also, if you are coming out to the show, please remember food and drinks, please. Um, you know, show the love to the facility uh, because, uh, you know, they're allowing the, the uh, show to happen uh, on on this platform. So um, just be uh, a really good night out and uh, treat yourselves well. And uh, let's uh, let's get ready for some wrestling because, boy, oh, boy, August is coming soon and SummerSlam will be here before we know it, Joe. Yeah, as I said, we just I just got off the phone. I was a couple of minutes late and putting together the deal to uh, have some shows. You know, we have made some good friends in the business, and we're happy to say that, you know, we're going to be working together once again with uh, some companies. So we're also looking at uh, 
somehow that weekend we got a maneuver because of the Saturday night SummerSlam instead of Sunday. But, you know, we're looking at being involved in shows, you know, Friday, maybe two, you know, we're looking at natural born killers on Friday night, but that might be a, a 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock type uh, start time. Uh, then we're also looking at a Saturday afternoon show, you know, and then it's possible that we'll do a Sunday afternoon show. Uh, we got companies that are looking to use the FSW arena, uh, whether it's a joint show or they, they're looking to run themselves out here. You know, it's definitely going to be, you know, a mini WrestleMania, you know, we won't have 50 shows like they have, but we'll be involved in, you know, as many as we can do, and, and hopefully uh, the fans will be uh, receptive to to our events that weekend. Looking forward to it. And Brandon, before uh, we uh, sign off, uh, what is your uh, social media handle so fans can follow you if they don't? Uh, Instagram is GetHouse316. Twitter is GetHouse. And Facebook is GetHouse. There we go. I'm glad you could join us today, man. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, yeah. It's it's a great story and a great journey that you've had, um, not only out here, but through your career. And uh, we definitely appreciate you, you know, taking the time to, uh, you know, give a little look behind the curtains for the uh, fans. Yeah. And Joe, yes. always, thank you very much. Um, and uh, people listening, thank you so much. Uh, remember to listen to the Vegas Bad Boys of Podcasting and all the stuff we offer. And until next time, we'll see you later.